Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar on teaching effective listening skills for equitable learning. We welcome you here today. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, let's first do some introductions. I'm Monica Brady Meyerov. I'm the founder and CEO of ListenWise, and I'm the author of a forthcoming book called Listen Wise Teach Students to Be Better Listeners. And I'm so thrilled today to be joined by Rachel Kramer Theodoro. She's an elementary education faculty leader at Brandeis University here in Boston, where I'm also located. And Laura Krenicke, who's a sixth grade global studies teacher in neighboring Connecticut. So first of all, I'd love to just get a level set on your familiarity with building listening skills. So if you could just answer this poll, how often do you focus on building listening skills with your students? All right, I'm excited to see already frequently is much higher than in the past. <laughs> and typically when I ask this question, it's you, the, the, uh, the leaning is more to sometimes to rarely. Um, but I can see too that with some of the, what I'm hearing, what I'm seeing in the chat about the people attending, we've got some people who understand the importance of listening skills in helping struggling readers and helping English language learners and helping early learners as well. So really excited that you're already um, very interested and uh, that you already use a lot of listening skills. Just a quick agenda. I'm going to talk a little bit about why listening is important uh, to add to your learning, especially to help you reach your equity goals. We're going to focus on five key practices to use listening for equitable learning, and we're going to take your questions. So first of all, um, Listening is really foundational to learning, and we know that listening comprehension and reading comprehension are very tightly tied. There are many research studies that show this, and the graph on the lower right-hand side show you that the, it's actually students uh, are better listeners than they are readers up until the eighth grade and beyond. So there's a lot of opportunity here to help with content and, and language by adding listening. Now, listening, especially paired with reading, the transcript can much enhance um, recall. So that little graphic on the left shows that combining print and audio increases recall by 40%. And listening is also a great format to address learning differences, especially supporting special education students, dyslexic students, students who are learning English as their second language. We'll go into more detail on these populations uh, in the presentation. But there are so many benefits to improving listening skills academically overall. And another one is just great for college and career readiness skill. When your students go to college, they're going to be, uh, they're going to have a lot of demands placed on their listening. And for them to all be prepared to listen to a lecture in college or a, uh, you know, new manager at their job explaining their tasks is really important. The last thing I'll say is that listening is, a, is really an equalizer that um, when you're sharing a good story, an audio story with your students, everyone's hearing the same story, and then you're providing supports that they need to, uh, to understand it, as opposed to when you are reading a text and potentially leveling that text up or down. Um, they might be getting some of the same content, but they're not getting the same language structure and vocabulary. Then there are also so many ways that listening can support your instructional goals. Using nonfiction audio stories like news stories, connect what's happening in your classroom with what's happening around the world and beyond. So these stories are important. They've got engaging topics. You could talk about things like the power shortages in Texas, the um, Major League Baseball recognizing the Negro League on its 100th birthday. Um, these are contemporary issues. You can also discuss them in a debate forum. Format. We're going to talk a little bit more about how that brings in the speaking practice of listening. And, and listening to a story um, can also bring equity to the sort of the academic rich language that is uh, needed to build um, comprehension for ELs. And then finally, listening is a state standard in all 50 states. And in 22 states, listening is tested on the high stakes test. So if you're in an SBAC state, your students are getting tested on their listening skills as part of their ELA, um, their ELA practice. Um, so being preparing them for that, giving them the listening stamina that they need to do well, uh, will serve them well. 
So as I said, we're going to focus now on five key practices to using listening. And um, these are all research-based, proven practices that can be used with all students. And we'll call out some specific practices that are especially good for ELs and students with learning dif differences. Let me start first by the number one is pre-teaching vocabulary. Um, what I'm going to do now is turn it turn to Rachel to talk a little bit about this framework and the research around it and why it's important. All right. Thank you, Monica. I um, hope everyone can hear me okay. And um, I'd like to share a little bit of information that is old, but it's old enough to say it's good. And I remember sitting in your seats as practitioners for many years. So everything I'm going to share with you is research-based, but practitioner ready. So <laughs> hold on to your hats. Um, so pre-teaching a vocabulary is really um, a critical skill, obviously, for the sake of the vocabulary itself and building um, content fluency. Um, but what it really does is it demystifies and familiarizes um, students with what's happening or what's about to happen in their class. And it can do be done in a way that really hooks students. But you have to take some time to really think about what you're going to choose for your vocabulary. You have to prioritize. And... Um, so Isabella Beck, Margaret McCowan, and Linda Kukin's research from a while back is really still quite present in our minds. And though these three tiers you may recognize um, have been around, they're being sort of repurposed and reconceptualized nowadays. Um, tier three vocabulary words, we call those the domain specific, the technical. Um, I'm very familiar with the WIDA standards. Many of you are in WIDA states, um, uh, the ELD, English Language Development Standards, that are brand new as of <clears throat> December 2020. And they really focus on these as being um, uh, uh, very specific to a content area and specific to success for that language. Um, and yes, it's important to focus on words like ecosystem and germinate. But really, most importantly, in the tier two domain um, are these cross-disciplinary words. These are words like emerge and classify and layers. And the reason why these are so important and, and really worthwhile your, to your time to be spending on teaching and using and practicing is because if you're teaching for, let's say, the butterfly life cycle, which is really common, right? And your children are able to say, the butterfly is coming out. It's coming out. Look, it's coming out. But they can write or say the butterfly is emerging. It really describes that in such a much more clear fashion. Um, you know, you have to prioritize the, the tier two words or the tier one words as well. Um, and hopefully um, you can, um, you know, you can, you can think clearly about what you want to teach, why you want to teach it. Another thing about why you want to choose and pre-teach vocabulary is you want to think about the function of vocabulary. So Michael Halliday, the um, father of functional linguistics, has always said, be choosy about what you want to use this vocabulary for. Are you going to be describing, explaining? And we'll talk about that a bunch later. Um, so this is one of, these are some of the important things. You know, keep it in a routine. Make sure you have rich context um, in terms of visuals and so on. And, um, and make it really... Uh, time worthwhile spending um, with your students. <laughs> it, it's so true that what you do, what you spend time on in the classroom is so important. Um, let's talk a little bit more about this sort of specifics of some of the academic language that is easy for kids to um, acquire and, and the more difficult language, which I think building and listening exercises can help with, and that's academic language. Absolutely. So um, right now I'm teaching students, um, student teachers who are all virtually teaching like the rest of you. It's been a joy, let me tell you. And I don't even have to tell you, right? Um, but they have said to me, Rachel, you know, I just want my kids to be engaged and to like what they're doing and to get the gist. And I say, and, and they, they criti they're they criti critical of me in, in the name of social justice, which is the right thing to do, which is to say, Let's in include all languages. Let's include all children's ways of expression. And I say, yes, absolutely. And these, the academic language, what you see on the right, that more precise, that more nuanced language is the language that we use as professionals. It's the language that's used in college. It's the language that's used in so many um, specific disciplines. And what the WIDA program is saying is that it's the language for success, right, in the academic content. And so we really need to redouble our efforts to um, dissect the nuance, the, the intricacies um, of academic language. How is it organized? What are its purposes um, in all four domains? Um, and one of the things I like to share with my students is a metaphor that I learned from another um, colleague of mine, which is the fish doesn't recognize the water in which it swims. 
And if you really think about that, we all are teaching. I'm talking, talking, talking right now. And I could really stop and, and dissect my language. And it's that language. I, whenever my students say, oh, they're not getting it, they're not engaged, I say, stop. Think about your language. Let's parse it. Let's look at the verbs. Let's look at the, the organization. Let's look at your idioms. Let's look at your um, pauses and your sentence lengths and so on. And um, if that's not really obvious to kids when they're learning. And so we have to guide that process of really parsing that academic language. Um, <clears throat> And um, we'll talk more about Jeff Weir's work a little bit later, and I'll put a link to his work in the chat, his fantastic and very useful website. But um, Jeff Weir's um, posits with speaking and listening practice in particular, which is his work, that we need to teach academic language along with um, higher order thinking skills and practices, listening and speaking practices, so that kids can be successful in the language for content. That's a great point. Thank you. And I see somebody in the chat says, also look at the speed of the speaking that they're listening to. That's another key point as well. But I think your points about um, what you said, the fish doesn't recognize it's in the water. Was that what you said? Yes. Um, I think a great example of that is um, one of the features we have on ListenWise, um, which I, I'll say right now is a free resource for teachers. Anyone can sign up for free and elect to have a free trial of premium. But um, uh, what I'm showing you today, these are free resources, uh, is a fun story that has a lot of academic language hidden in it. So I'm going to um, jump over and play this story for you because it's such a great example of everything we've been talking about with um, academic language. And I'm going to ask Laura to talk a little bit about how she would use this in the classroom. So again, this is just a 30 second story, which is packed full of academic vocabulary. Here we go. front porch. Maybe that's what was going through the mind of a yellow lab named Cleo when she traveled 60 miles to her family's old house in Lawson, Missouri. They moved out in 2018. The new residents recently came home to find Cleo lounging on the porch. She's since been reunited with her family at their current address. No one knows how she traveled those 60 miles, but it must be a really great front porch. So a really fun short story that allows a lot of vocabulary. So I just pulled out some more of the words there that you could go over um, with your students. Uh, Laura, tell us how you use these these shorter weird news uh, features on on ListenWise. Yeah, so ListenWise has a, a, a lot of these. They're all about under 60 seconds, some usually sometimes even as short as 30 seconds. They're high interest, they're engaging, and they are relatable. The students really enjoy the stories that come out because there's probably something that they already liked. But as Monica mentioned, they're really rich in vocabulary, and it, you can get a con um, a, the, contact, the context of the language pretty easily. And it sounds in a very familiar way. So you're getting the vocabulary in really uh, familiar text. Yeah, that's great. Thank you so much for sharing that. And we have dozens of those that are, I know, lots of fun for people to use. Um, all right, so going on to the next point is talking more specifically about building background knowledge, activating prior knowledge. Um, I put up here a, a, an anticipation guide because it can help to do this, um, but I'll first turn to Rachel to talk a little bit about the research behind why this is so key, not only for reading, but I really want you to think about how this can help with listening as well. Absolutely. And so um, when we think about building background, um, uh, first of all, this is a fantastic strategy, the anticipation guide, because it starts by allowing children and kids to think, how do I fit into this context? What is it that makes a lot of sense to me? And and what can I say about it already? Um, it, it's also important because um, it it helps to connect. And so that's the idea in, in part of, um, of making connections, right? Um, but it also connects to past learning. So if I have spent some time learning about this topic, I am being urged to think about what I've already learned, and that will bring me into the new um, subject that we're learning today. Another piece of building background is filling in the gaps. So sometimes we need to spend time with our students to give them, you know, context. So that that story we were just listening to, maybe they're going to talk about, you know, has, have you ever seen signs for lost pets and pets running away and things like that, right? And so maybe there's going to be some time to fill in some gaps. And all of these things are, yes, for buy-in. We want our kids to 
um, be, um, you know, engaging and, and uh, with our content, but we want them to authentically engage. And that's, that's really one of the most important things. Um, building background is going to engage and, and ready students for what they're about to start speaking about. Well, let's go to a specific example of that. I'm going to throw it back to you, Laura, to talk about this lesson from ListenWise and some of the things you've um, circled that you want to talk about how you build student background to get them ready to hear this story. Yeah, this is actually probably an unusual way of going about this, um, but I use uh, ListenWise often for um, pre- for, for learning about another con or about another subject or about our next unit that's coming up. And using this as a pre-listening strategy, um, we talk about this um, story about the Black Panther um, at, as part of a cultural geography unit that we do on Sub-Saharan Africa. And so middle school students, I teach sixth grade, middle school student, students are all over movies and the Marvel comics. And so my intent for this story is twofold. One, it's really to capture their student interest. Just like those weird news stories, we want to capture their student interest in connecting with the um, geography of sub-Saharan Africa. And two, we want to talk about why the story resonated with so many in breaking stereotypes. Now, I myself have not seen the movie, but I do know that that is part of um, the, the purpose behind the film. So even though students may not recognize um, what those two purposes are when we first start it, um, this it, the story is only two minutes long. This Black Panther movie st uh, story is two minutes. And what we do is we set up a, a listening organizer for them to help them go through and listen to the story. We go through it a few times just to make sure they're getting all the language. Um, and we have, we'll use a very short listening organizer or a graphic organizer to capture their ideas as students are listening. And then we can go back and check for understanding and expound a little bit more on the story. So for example, one of the questions may even just be a true or false question. We'll ask before Black Panther, so just so you know, setting it up in the story, they talk about how um, people who are, or the Black characters were portrayed in comic books before the movie, or the story Black Panther was made. So we ask in there, um, before Black Panther, Black characters in comic books were portrayed as vampires or devilish. Is that true or false? And in the question actually combines two things that the speaker says in the story. And it summarizes how those black characters have been played, had been represented before the franchise. And then that would then lead to a discussion. Okay, so how were characters or how were heroes previously portrayed? And why is this story different? What took it so long for um, a black character to become the hero of a story? So it's a great way to start the discussion. Another uh, listening organizer question we may have is another true and false one. And again, I teach geography and world culture. So um, the question is, the nation of Wakanda and Black Panther is fiction. Is that true or false? It's very interesting to see how students relate to this because they think it's a real place. But it also brings in that academic language piece again the word fiction. And if you notice, even in the description that you see on the page, it says it's fictitious. So you're seeing different forms of the same word. Um, and, and actually, it even talks about fictional in the story. So you're seeing multiple versions of the same word. Um, and it's also a starting point for the discussion of why the name of the country was chosen, where it's supposedly located, which is supposed to be next to Uganda, and how might people who live in that region now feel about having their place fictionalized um, and, you know, knowing that you're technically from that area. And other, other stories, so here's the discussion that we can have. What other stories have you read that have settings and places that may have been fictionalized? And so kids think about the Lord of the Rings or even the Star Wars movies, <laughs> for that matter. Um, the main gist of the story is also not really so much about the movie, but it's about how adult, adults were trying to get um, groups of students to go see it. And so one of the questions in the listening organizer, by the way, I think I only had four questions in the organizer, but this was one of them. It said, why did adults raise money for kids to see the movie? And what did kids say about seeing it? And so this one now looks a little bit more into representation. Um, some of the answers were that women are seen as the strongest warrior. So it's not necessarily just the black characters, but now they're black women um, seeing as roles of power, um, that people have the right to stand up for what they believe in, which really relates back to our social justice issues that we're discussing in our own country right now. And that the term third world country is actually 
you know, really offensive and discriminatory. So only in a two minute story, this is activating, first of all, that prior knowledge and possibly even prior bias. Um, and then it helps us to build context for new learning. Um, so that now that they have a little bit of a foundation, now we can dive a little bit deeper um, in discussing um, more about the topic and then looking at, you know, some of those global issues. That's fantastic. Thank you for sharing all of that. Um, I also want to point out you circled the Lexile audio measure on mm. the screen, and I'll just talk about that for a minute because I think it is important in finding the right resources for your students so that um, they can be successful. You all might be familiar with the Lexile text measure and the Lexile reading measure for students. Well, uh, we partnered with Metametrics, the makers of the Lexile measure, to create this audio measure because there had never been a way previously to determine how difficult is this story to listen to? Um, what is the, how does the syntax of the um, grammar fit into it, the, the vocabulary level, the pace of speech? So uh, Lexile has come up with this new measure and it's scientifically based. It's on a scale that's similar to the text measure and it will allow you, if, if you are on ListenWise, and as I said, you can, get a pre, you can get a free trial of premium to see these additional features, it'll show you with supports what this number, this 1370 Lexile audio measure is good for what grade level. But the idea here is being specific and deliberate around scaffolding for what your students need. And the other thing I didn't point out, but somebody asked in the chat, can you slow it down? Because it's true, those, those weird news especially go by very quickly. And we do have a uh, slow button to help. Um, again, it's all about scaffolding. So uh, thank you, Laura. And moving on to the next uh, poll we've got here, I want to know what's most challenging for you to make sure that you are promoting equitable learning. So I'm curious to hear about your where you are in your quest to do this and what's holding you back. Uh, interesting. Oh, we have a lot of um, teaching in remote or hybrid setting. Wow. And that I can understand is so difficult because um, it's just very hard to see where students are, you know, a lot of, and Laura, can you speak to this? Because I, <laughs> if you're feeling the same way, I see you nodding. Yeah, actually, I am remote. I'm 100% remote. Um, right now, my students are hybrid. My district, thankfully, is letting me so far continue working hybrid until everything sorts out. So I totally appreciate that challenge that I'm actually, some kids are in the classroom, some kids are at home. But the nice thing is, is that they're, um, it, through ListenWise, you actually have a way of monitoring student progress. Um, and I don't know if we'll be able to have time to show that on here. I didn't anticipate that question, but there is a way of, of monitoring that. Um, on the other end. And it is absolutely a challenge, but I think actually having these um, stories are actually really helpful because students can go back and re-listen to them on their own as well when they're just not in front of you. Great. Thanks for sharing that. All right. Moving on to the third point is talking about language and content together. So in addition to academic words, listening is an excellent way for students to build content knowledge. Laura was just giving a great example of that in teaching a fun audio story about a movie, but actually builds a lot of understanding about Africa. And um, a key, this is all a very key factor in reading success. So it's not just about learning vocabulary words. Um, Professor Jeffrey Zwier says it's about um, really learning a much more um, way of communicating academic language. There's a danger in over-focusing on individual words and instead of connecting it all together. So the connective tissue in many ways is the content. Right, Rachel? Absolutely. And I was going to say that I was just thinking today that one of my students said, how am I going to engage my you know, 10th grade social studies class. And I said, you know what, maybe you should start giving points for listening and speaking in, in class. And I'm thinking, you know, you could do that with ListenWise so brilliantly, but we, we're, we're going to set up a little system for that. But anyways, my two cents on that, that conversation. Um, yeah, so Weeda, and I just put a few things in the chat, and I'll put this Jeff Swear's um, site in the chat again, um, has um, refreshed their standards, and they really are wonderful. Um, and I come from two backgrounds. I'm both an ESL teacher, but I'm also a content teacher. And so um, I have uh, an affinity for helping content teachers, special educators, 
even um, paraprofessionals, um, to start seeing that water in which we swim, that language in which we swim. And the new standards are a brilliant resource for that. Um, we have to do this work collectively. I really encourage collaboration. In fact, the research shows right now, and there's a huge piece in the new data standards for how to be um, how to work collaboratively on language and content together. So ESL teachers, get ready, go grab your content teacher friends and um, and get connected because this, this document will help you do that. Um, but it's a lot like taking all the pieces in a jigsaw puzzle and dumping them out on the table and sorting. You know, what I say to my students is that, um, uh, first of all, all students are language learners. So A-L-L-S, not E-L-L-S. We are all language learners. And so if we can dump out our content and take out the language over here and put the content over here and really start to go through um, what it is that our students are supposed to be able to do with that content, um, how are they listen? What are they listening to that they need to key into that they then need to use to really track the speaking and listening of our students and what we're saying and doing? And then to not just focus on what are we reading, comprehension, and what are we going to write on paper, but to look at all four of those domains in each and every one of our lessons. Um, so that's just you know a beginning thought on that on that point. Yeah, thank you. I love your point that we are all learners. We are all language learners. That's a great way to look at it. And it's especially, I think it's a great way to look at it in terms of how you can use listening to do that. Mm -hmm. um, go a little bit deeper into the, the WIDA standards here and how they view the key language usage uses, if you would, Rachel. Yeah, absolutely. And this is something, this piece of their um, platform is not 100% new. It's been around for a number of years, and really it comes out of functional linguistics, which comes out of many, many years ago of research from Michael Halliday and others. Um, and that basically um, what researchers did at, at the University of Wisconsin at Madison is they looked at the various disciplines, you know, reading, math, science, all of them, um, even looking at uh, specials like art and music and, and looking also at social instructional language. And they came up with something called um, genres of language. And genres, yes, are biography and nonfiction and some of those other things. But they also looked at what are some of the language um, um, language. Uh, purposes and functions that occur in each one of these genres. And so you'll notice in the picture, they've chosen these four, narrate, argue, inform, and explain. And these are probably familiar to, to many of you because this whole functional approach and why, why we use language and for what purposes is abundant in all of our disciplines. Um, but they also overlap. So at times you may narrate and argue at the same time. So I could tell you something important, but I could also say, here's my reason why it's so important, right? And so um, they, the overlapping circles honor those kinds of mixes. And sometimes we're doing everything all together, as you can see in the very um, middle of, the, of that diagram. Um, and so um, essentially, um, WIDA is looking for us to identify how the language of, let's just say, Laura's lesson, right, on Black Panther, you know, is she expecting students to inform each other on the facts, right? Or is she also asking, let's get more into an explanation of why were these particular um, portrayals happening in a particular context of time, right? Um, maybe she's also going to have her students be listening for particular lines in the news story that have um, someone who's an activist arguing a point and saying, we need to stop this. And they're going to be really Laura, Laura and other great teachers like Laura are going to be parsing through this language to help their students see the nuanced forms of those language, you know, adverbs are a great example of that LY words uh, often will argue. Um, and there are also structural pieces. So these are some of the great shifts. And I encourage you to take a look at um, the new WIDA standards. Even if you're not a WIDA state, you can get free access to these standards and tools. Thank you. Great idea. Let's take a look at a really great example of using language and content together in a story about Homeland Security that we're going to go to on ListenWise. And um, what this does is sort of gives an example. Laura's going to talk us through how she used this story um, to teach a, a very important subject matter um, using listening. Are you going to play the part first? Or oh, why don't you explain a little bit about okay. how you scaffolded and what we're going to be listening for, and then I'll play. Okay, good. So actually, I do want to address one of the questions that kind of popped up in the chat as well is about the Lexile um, level. This one is actually a higher level than the other one that I shared for, for good reason. Um, but the Alexile um, for listening, the strands are, are different. They don't, go, they don't correspond exactly to the way that the reading ones do. So if you see a level, and maybe if you want to, 
explain that first just for, I know that's coming up later, but maybe that would be a good. No, it's a good thing to note. I, the yeah. thing to note is that students can listen two to three grade levels higher than they can read. So the first thing to know is that looking at this, um, looking at the uh, Lexile level here helps give you a range of what a second grader or what a seventh grader can listen to. Um, and the this, this strands that and they're not exactly on the same scale as the text level. So if you know your student's text level, um, you can use that as a rough guide, but you're definitely going to want to look for a higher Lexile level. Thank you for thank you for explaining that because I did see that popped up in the chat as well. Um, this story about Homeland Security, um, the, it actually has five different speakers in this story. So you not only have to kind of keep track of who the speakers are, which um, LessonWise does, they put the names of the, of the speakers on the side. Um, you can find out what the role is of each of the speakers. Some of them there are a part of the narrating team. Some of them are um, government officials. Um, and so actually even just starting with that saying there's multiple people talking in the story will actually help them differentiate the point of view that it's the, the speaker is coming from and this story ha it maybe will require more scaffolding to support the language and for example the story is really about the development of homeland security um, that followed 9-11 and there's some language in here that may be unfamiliar to students, especially the EL students. Um, there will definitely need to be some pre-teaching, uh, for, for middle grades anyway, for pre-teaching or activating prior knowledge to, will help, and also pre-introducing some of the vocabulary and phrases from the story that will then help with the context. And you'll see a few of those words on the screen. Um, there's also differing forms of words, like the word resilience and, again, resiliency. Uh, they're both used in there. Um, bureaucracy is another word that is used in there. And the quote from there is one of the first responses in Washington to the 9-11 attacks was to rearrange the bureaucracy. So when you hear that, students may not be able to tell from the context <laughs> what that word actually means. Some may more readily understand it as like a government organization or a group. And then you're like, okay, now I understand what that is. Well, that's a great intro to the story. So I'm going to play the first minute or so, and I want Perfect. you all to keep your ears uh, pricked up for these idioms and words like bureaucracy used in, in a very different way that could be hard for kids to understand. One of the first responses in Washington to the 9-11 attacks was to rearrange the bureaucracy. Then President George W. Bush appointed former Pennsylvania Governor Tom Ridge as the first director of Homeland Security. In November 2002, Congress established a standalone Department of Homeland Security. The new department absorbed 22 different federal agencies with the idea of unifying Homeland Security efforts. Has it made us safer? NPR's Brian Naylor reports. In its early days, the Department of Homeland Security was something of a makeshift affair. The first secretary, Tom Ridge, operated out of a double cubicle, a bit more modest workspace than most of his fellow cabinet officers. The different agencies, computers couldn't talk to one another, and there were the inevitable turf wars. Current Homeland Security Secretary Janet Napolitano gives her predecessors, Ridge and Michael Chertoff, a lot of credit for getting the thing going. I think that Secretary Ridge and Chertoff did yeoman's work in getting the department up off its feet. Um, it's the kind of department that it's kind of, uh, you have to build the plane while you fly it. And I think that it has uh, really begun to, to gel in important ways. So that was just a minute of the story. And think of how many words, uh, tier two vocabulary words and idioms that you heard, uh, turf wars and build the plane while you fly it. Um, tell me a little bit more, Laura, about how you help your students access this language with this very dense content. And why does yeah, and listening help you do that? Yeah, there's even more than that are listed on here. Um, these other ones taking, be able to take a punch and bounce back. There's a lot of really rich language things in there. Um, and so sometimes having a listening organizer will help with that to listen ahead of time for these or, or, or write them down ahead so that they can anticipate. An anticipation guide would be helping. Um, having a listening organizer with those terms already annotated. So it might help the student to isolate the language to draw meaning from the context, if possible. Um, and the lesson is also published with the story um, that helps students um, develop an argument-based um, 
um, yeah, an argument based on opinion, which I thought was an interesting thing because, of course, you have all these experts there, but because it was a new thing, it's really the opinions of these experts and then finding parts of the story to use as evidence. So um, knowing that their claim is their opinion and discussing that reasoning with each other can then help the, them develop to develop their ability to critique their work and those of their peers, which ties into what Rachel was just saying about uh, those four, four domains and how they intersect with each other. Thank you. Moving on to number four, let's talk a little bit about scaffolding and how that can be a key part of your practice um, in using listening. I listed some oral scaffolds here, and um, I've even seen people commenting about reading and listening in the chat. So, um, Rachel, I'm going to pass it off to you to help us understand how, sca how scaffolds make sense for listening. Absolutely. Yeah. And I tell my students, um, scaffolds are the ways that our students make sense of what they're learning. I like to tell them that they're flexible and they're flexibly used, um, that you can have, I always have my students create a, a class-wide scaffold. We're all going to use this graphic organizer. We're all going to use an anticipation guide. We're all going to use whatever it is. And then I always have on deck um, a few extra scaffolds for individuals who I think will need more. Um, and, may, and some of them are low prep, like, you know, a quick Let's quickly, um, you know, do a comprehend aloud, for example, like I'm going to read this or we're going to listen to this part of the, the story together. And I'm going to tell you what I'm actually thinking in my mind, what words made me think of certain things, what phrases, what background knowledge I'm bringing in. And then I'm going to have you do that with a partner. That's sort of like a quick scaffold you can do right there in the moment. Um, you know, retelling when you um, do some retelling activities. Think about um, having students uh, play roles in that process. So sometimes they can retell um, the beginning. You know, you have students listen just to the beginning, have students listen to certain characters in the story, certain problems in the story. And so you can break up the retelling um, scaffolding. Um, and in other ways, and I actually have my book here, Building Academic Language by Jeff Swears. And um, I thought I would just show you because sometimes the covers resonate with us. But sometimes um, you can just spend some time reading and rereading each section. And just like Laura was saying, pause and point out that was an idiom, yeoman's work, right? What is a yeoman, right? Let's stop and really think about that. Well, let's think about what came before it. I always talk to my students about saying, when you look at phrases that don't make sense, look at what is um, in, around, and up. So if you don't look, if, when you're looking in, you look at the context. When you look around, um, or you're looking at words like yo and men, and what does that really mean? But when you're looking around it, you're looking at context. So you can also look, at, look words up in the dictionary. And so there's a whole variety of ways of scaffolds. But I think the key thing is, um, that I always say this to my students, is um, uh, be sure that you choose the scaffolds and, and use them over and over again. Nobody likes to have a whole brand new graphic organizer or a whole brand new set of um, roles to, to use during um, a shared retelling. Or if you do think aloud and, and turn, turn in talks or comprehend aloud, um, you know, have the same partners for a few days so that kids can become really comfortable with each other um, as they take the risks to make sense. And that's really what scaffolding is. It's the sense-making time um, in any given lesson. Yeah, I had a fourth grade teacher tell me how, who, who focuses uh, her support of English learners, how great it was to do a retell on the weird news stories because they're <laughs> only 30 seconds long. So the point was you'd listen once for context, then you'd listen the second time taking notes and really digesting what you learned, and then you'd turn and talk to your neighbor to tell them and get your own words together. And then the third lesson was to solidify your story, and then you would retell it. So you can do that easily with a short audio um, as a really great exercise. Yeah, I'm just going to, yeah, go on. I was just going to say, I really am in favor of practicing roles in small groups too. So have two or three kids together doing some of those things that you were just mentioning, and then they can do it independently over time. I've already shown you some of ListenWise Live to see that scaffolding in practice. The transcript with the audio is on every single story. It's There's so much research that shows how supportive this is for students to be able to recognize words as they're read. And hearing them spoken authentically is also very important. I know there are many computer-assisted read-alongs, but it's not the same as hearing somebody say uh, the words um, authentically spoken. And then, of course, just note on the top right-hand side, you can see there is this 
toggle switch for slower that slows the audio down by 20% and the transcript stays synchronized. So those are just um, a couple of the scaffolds we have on ListenWise Premium. As I said, ListenWise is free for teachers and then you can also take a free trial of premium that lasts 30 days or can go longer if you're working, um, if you want your whole school involved. The other thing I want to just show, we kind of jumped to this a little bit earlier, but this new Lexile framework for listening really allows us to know the difficulty of an audio passage. And this is also so important for scaffolding, being able to pick the right stories that help your students feel successful. So it's on a Lexile scale that's similar to the one used for reading. And eventually we, we will be building the Lexile listening measure of the students, as you see on the right. We don't have that complete yet. These audio measures are so new that we're just gathering feedback about how teachers are using them and how they work. But eventually, we'd like to be able to um, be able to know a student's listening level and the audio level of a passage and do a much better job matching the two. Um, so I'm curious, Laura, how do you use the Lexile um, audio measures when you're when, in your teaching? Yeah, there is a filter on the um, ListenWise website that you can uh, filter it out by Lexile level so you can find out if something is beyond. For example, that story that we just did with 9-11 is definitely beyond um, and it may go with a specific topic. Um, but if students are actually doing their own research, I don't limit them on the Lexile level. Um, I will pick one that's close to or just above where we are um, to let students um, get acclimated to a topic, to a subject, something we'll do together. But if students are doing their own um, student-driven research and in inquiry, um, I will let them have free reign <laughs> and let them choose their own stories. If I see the one that may really be, a, be beyond them, I may gear them towards something that would be a little bit lower. But now having that tool is really a great help for me as a teacher because otherwise, you know, I would filter and not know if something was really above them or not. So it's nice to have like a quick snapshot to say, okay, you're in the right range, go with it. Thanks for sharing that. I, I should add that uh, while we've been playing some higher level middle and high school stories, ListenWise has stories for grades K to 12. And we haven't played any of the elementary content. It is definitely made for kids. It's geared at a lower uh, Lexile audio measure. And the way it's presented is very different. So um, if you have elementary students, or even if you have um, more beginner English language learners, you're going to want to search for the elementary content on ListenWise. All right, moving on to our last point, speaking practice. So um, the, the standards around listening are really speaking and listening, and it's so important for our learners to be um, hearing and then producing speech. So it makes sense that um, we want to talk about how listening can help foster these academic conversations. Rachel? Yeah. Hi. I'm going to put in, your, um, in the chat again, Jeff Swears fantastic work. And um, what I really love about his work is, um, and I, I feel so fortunate because I met him years ago at a conference here in Massachusetts, at WIDA conference, and um, he was just opening up this work that he had, been, had started in San Francisco, really chronicling how kids have conversations and what they're actually doing to listen. And what he found was it's not just about the vocabulary and the scaffolds and the language objectives and so on. It really isn't about that stuff. It's about some of the soft skills of, of, of listening and, and speaking. And so he teaches this great book um, written by a colleague of mine here in Massachusetts, it's Academic Conversations in K-3, to um, has beautifully illustrated um, uh, graphic or, um, graphics here to, to help children learn how to um, do important work of, of conducting a conversation and holding a conversation back and forth. I mean, I don't know how many of you have children and or even young children and, you know, they can have conversations when they're really engaged and interested. And I think one of the things that he says is, A, you have to teach um, children how to choose great topics and to, to learn to become interested and intrigued by what the other person is saying. And that's a skill. You have to learn that, right? And you also have to learn um, how to do eye contact, how to nod, how to say, uh-huh, yes, yes, how to ask a good question of your partner. And you can do this with the quick turn and talks, you know, what did you think about why the character did this in the story, all the way into the grander debates. And with scaffolds and structures and practice, 
You can even do like a morning, you know, joke telling session if you wanted to, to practice listening skills and speaking. Um, and these texts that I've shown you and also on his website, he has all sorts of free printouts, very good for us educators, free printouts of um, uh, graphic organizers and routines that you can start building in, including a conversation mat with hand signals. Um, you could teach kids how to build on each other's ideas and you could teach them how to say their points by using their fingers like this. So it's really a fantastic framework. And I just like the fact that he really is um, upholding this hard work of listening in addition to the speaking. So it's good stuff. Those are great examples. Um, let's go to one more uh, using specifically debate as a way to spark conversations. And um, on Listen Wise, every Friday, there's kind of divided into two categories of stories. We have current events every day, every school day. And on Fridays, we choose a debate story to really spark conversations. And then we have a lessons collection that has uh, stories that are more aligned to your curriculum in science, social studies, and ELA. Again, K through uh, two through 12. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Laura, because I know you love to use these debate stories. And I bet in the sixth grade, the kids must be into it and really love picking a side and arguing it. Yeah, well, every kid would say, yes, they should have cell phones. So that, <laughs> that would be an easy one. But what I, I find that this year, especially, it's so nice because these stories are short, um, again. And what we have at, at many schools are doing a lot with social emotional um, learning strategies this, this year with everything else going on with COVID. And so we have these smaller groups now. We call them advisory groups. Um, you know, we have a small group of maybe six or seven students together. And these are great for that type of thing. And we'll say, okay, let's listen to the story. Here's a debate. Now you have to try to work together to convince me that you should have one. And so now suddenly it's a high interest story <laughs> there. And we don't have a lot of time with maybe a half hour for this advisory period. So they have a chance to dive into the story. They work together to start discussing it together, to um, explain it to each other, to come up with their reasons. And then they turn and they try to convince me whether or not they should get one. So and, and it doesn't have to just be this. It could be there's so many different um, debate stories that are out there that even every week we could pick a different story and use that as part of our um, discussion for advisory. You know, that's just something you made, you said, made me think about how uh, before we learn to read, we listen. Before we learn to write, we listen. We can speak, but as you're, as you're in the academic setting, you really need to learn how to listen in order to speak well. So listening is really at the foundation of all of this. And that's why we've spent the time focusing on these practices, um, these five practices today. So we're wrapping up here. We're going to go to the conversation, uh, answer some of your questions in a moment, but I wanted to just let you know that you can learn a lot more about listening um, from the book that uh, I have coming out in about a month and a half. It's uh, called Listen Wise, Teach Students to Be Better Listeners. And you can pre-order it anywhere you'd like to order your books. And um, this will really go into depth uh, about the neuroscience behind listening, listening and reading connection, assessment and listening, ELs and listening. I um, recommend it if you really want to go deep. And then also, if uh, it also has actually a lot of great practices too. So you walk away with class activities and things you can do in your classroom. You can also, as we've said throughout the webinar, sign up for a free trial. And if you um, are thinking about a school subscription to ListenWise for next year, we've got a discount code. You've got to just type contact me in the chat box. We'll send you the code and we'll get that to you. So I think the next thing we want to do here, actually, I think I have another, yeah, questions, our questions page here. Um, so I'm going to pull up a couple of audience questions. And one of them, I guess I'm going to show this one. I they want to, how do I help students who have trouble with reading comprehension in seventh grade with science content? This is, this is, I think speaks to the power of listening really strongly because as I said, students can listen better than they can read to the eighth grade and beyond. So whether it's science content or social studies content, if you look for audio resources that represent that, um, that's how you can help them build content knowledge through listening. Um, the other, there's another question. Oh, actually, Rachel, there's a request for you to go back and explain a little bit more this look in, around, and up again um, to, to understand that. Sure, yeah. Um, and, you know, every 
teacher knows this, that the best ideas are stolen, begged or begged for or borrowed, right? And so I'm sure I got it from someone else. And I, I want to add something to the science person's question too, because I have some ideas for that. But um, so um, if you, um, all words, right, have, have some sort of origin, right? And you can be thinking about, you know, origins that are not English or, you know, con contributing origins from other languages. But oftentimes we look for root words, we look for affixes, right? Um, we might also look, as Laura mentioned earlier, Earlier about nominalization. That's the idea that um, a verb like organize, uh, like organize could be flipped into organization. And so um, by looking in words, literally, imagine, I know when I was teaching early years of elementary school, we were word detectives, where we're looking for the little word inside the big word, right? Remember that from the K to three world? Um, if you look in the world, um, word, um, that's when we're looking at word parts. And that could be one way that we can understand what's going on with this word in the context. If you look around the word, that's a cue for using context clues. And that might mean reading the whole thing over or rewinding the, um, the story and then, um, and then, you know, having it fast forward, going back and forth, doing some retelling. And then if we don't understand something, we can look it up. I could go look up the Black Panther movie if I'd never watched a movie before, right? Um, and so that's that's the strategy right there. Um, and the last thing I'll just say is um, about the, the science. So this text is for uh, 6 through 12, but I've been rereading it lately, and there's a lot of good stuff in here for elementary teachers. It goes into the language of that water in which we swim, the language of science, the language of all disciplines. And the other thing is in this text, if you're a K3 teacher, and again, these are written for any teacher, it doesn't have to be you know, a general ed teacher. There's a whole section on how to do listening and speaking in science. So check them out. <laughs> yeah, and I saw somebody say in the chat too, what about for early learners? Any age is a good age to use listening with from the moment we're born. In fact, we are hearing in utero. So there's, and, and it's the last sense to go. So literally from the moment you're in the womb to the moment you leave this earth, you are listening and you are using that skill more than any other. So I encourage you to think deeply about how to use it in, in education. And um, just want to note that ListenWise, we sponsored this and we have a lot of great resources for you, but there's so many amazing podcasts and audio out there for free. Just want to get you listening and using it in your, ter in your teaching. So thank you again for attending. I especially want to thank my presenters. This was so much fun. Rachel Kramer Theodoro from Brandeis University and uh, Laura Krenicki. So much fun. Sixth grade teacher from Connecticut. <laughs> it's been wonderful to share this hour with you and with everyone who attended. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. It's been great. Thank Thanks so much, everybody. And have a great year, rest of the year. <laughs> thank you.